This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is taking just a few minutes today for you. Hello, and welcome or welcome back to Self Work. What you just heard was my very first podcast episode intro recorded back in October of 2016. Wow, I can remember being so nervous. And I was enunciating very carefully, which I probably should do now. (laughs) Anyway, welcome to this fourth anniversary show of Self Work. We just celebrated 200 episodes a couple of weeks ago, and now this is the fourth anniversary this week. So glad you're here. When I started, I really wanted to reach out to several different groups. Those of you who might already be interested in emotional or psychological issues, maybe you're even in therapy and just want another perspective. To those of you who've just been diagnosed with depression or anxiety and are looking for some answers. Or even those of you who might feel like you'd never darken the door of a therapist, but you're just curious enough to listen to a podcast. So welcome all of you to Self Work. I was reading reports on Hurricane Delta this morning and saw one Louisiana man's plea. Don't forget us. We'll be digging out of this for many years to come. I don't think I've ever worked with someone who's been through a trauma of some kind that's known to others that doesn't tell me something similar to this. What do I mean? At first, everyone is there. Food and flowers are delivered after a death. People offer to take your kids if you're recovering from surgery or you had a car wreck or your home was damaged in a tornado. If your friends know you've broken up with your significant other, you get texts and funny memes sent to you. But what happens a few weeks after that? A silence usually descends, and you're left to deal with that loss. Or the other situation that can happen is when the loss or the struggle is chronic, when it's going to be a long haul. It could be worse when it's mental illness especially. So today in this episode, sponsored by BetterHelp, we're going to focus on how to listen, how to get tuned in, and what it takes to do that, and what reactions you may have to confront in yourself. Terry Cheney, in her interview in the last episode, reminded us of the importance of that kind of caring, of saying, tell me where it hurts. In fact, she knows that that kind of caring actually saved her life. We'll also learn from a woman named Emma Marie Smith, who's a writer at The Mighty, about five things not to say and five things to say when trying to be there for someone with depression. It's not as hard as you might think, but you may not have had anyone model that behavior for you, so it's foreign to you, but you can learn. I entitled this episode, Finding the Right Thing to Say, and there's definitely a right thing and a wrong thing, so just a little education is what helps. Our listener email for today poses a very direct question about holding on to the past and not being able to work through grief and loss. Instead, even years later, This listener feels overwhelmed by suddenly losing the life she'd worked very hard to create and now can't seem to live in the present as she lost her partner. So sit back and relax. Enjoy this fourth anniversary, sort of, of self-work. I definitely started this week four years ago. And let's talk about finding the right thing to say. Most of us like to fix things. A leaky faucet that no longer drips, the tree that looked as if it might die, is brought slowly back through careful choices. From cars being repaired to grades being brought up to broken bones that are set just right and healed, we all like a happy ending. There, it's done. We can celebrate. Certainly the pandemic is challenging that thinking, as it seems that it's going to take time and incredible patience to deal with this life-threatening airborne illness. But this isn't an episode on the pandemic. I'll leave that for doctors and epidemiologists and even politicians to figure out while I do my part as I see it. But both John Moe in episode 193 and Terry Cheney in last week's episode talked about how people's caring, be it in the form of barriers that were put up by advocacy groups concerned with suicides on bridges, as John said, or friends reminding Terry of the quantity of days in her fairly predictable bipolar cycle. They'd say, you just have to make it till Thursday. Both of these authors were reminding all of us that recognizing and accepting the reality of just how difficult mental illness can sometimes become is a huge gift to give someone who's experiencing another wave of depression or anxiety, PTSD or OCD, whatever 
the issue is. Years ago, one of my good friends was battling what I knew were cycles of depression that hit her very hard from time to time. She wouldn't necessarily get suicidal, but these episodes grabbed her hard and totally robbed her of her usual vivacity and energy. She wasn't answering texts or calls, but I knew she was home, so I went by, and her door was open. She barely spoke. I simply left her some of the things I brought with me, very practical things that I thought she might need. I told her I loved her, and I was available, and I left. She later in front of me would tell other people that she couldn't believe that I'd do that and what it had meant to her. It was a little embarrassing, but it proved to me that doing nothing, allowing some loved one's darkness to stop you from reaching out, however minimally, was and is the wrong thing to do. The right thing is to do something, to act, to reach out. I've asked myself many times as a therapist after hearing over and over how people know that a loss is concerned, So they say something to try to fix it, or worse yet, they say nothing at all. So what's going on? What keeps the silence going? What what are people scared of that they'll find out or have to deal with if they ask? Or should I say, what are we all scared of? Because I do think it all boils down to fear. When my parents died within one week of each other back in 2007, the rest of my family and I heard a lot of those stupid things I was mentioning, mostly things that fixed it. Like they must have loved each other so much they couldn't live without the other. That sounds nice, perhaps, and they did love each other, but really? Does that mean if someone outlives their spouse by decades that there wasn't enough love? It was sort of an attempt at a Disney ending, but after all, we were grieving, and it did not help. So I've had to ask myself, why don't people risk and say something? Why can't we sit with the discomfort of not knowing what to say? What keeps so many of us from saying anything at all? And you can be sure it is at times uncomfortable. This makes me think of my Aunt Margaret, who I was delighted to be named after. I was in my 20s when she'd been diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. She was a non-smoker who lived with a chain smoker. She dressed every day, as long as she could, by my memory at least, and welcomed visitors with the grace and good humor she'd always possessed. She asked me one afternoon, Margaret, would you please come over and talk to me about what's really going on with you? I said yes, but was curious about the question. And she explained, People don't want to talk to me about good things because I'm dying. And people won't say anything negative because I'm dying. I don't feel like me anymore. So, of course, when someone you choose to check in with is sad or despairing or crying or mad or dying, you bet it can be hard. But you have to face your own fear, I think. What's that fear about? It's not only fear that you'll stick your foot in your mouth. I've decided that it's because of another kind of fear. Fear that your own life will get out of control, or the life of someone you love. That something can't be fixed, or at least fixed easily. And that scares us. So we sometimes choose not to remember or connect in any real way. How many of you, when you hear someone got cancer, or the virus, or their kids started doing drugs... How many of you start to ask questions about them? Were they smokers? Did they go out to a party? Was she hanging with the wrong crowd? We want to reassure ourselves that our lives are different. That couldn't happen to me or to our kid. It's denial. It's avoidance. It's plain old fear. And facing that fear can be so important. Because if you do, you'll be able to stay tuned in. And if you're tuned in, you'll be forgiven for saying something stupid because you're there and it's obvious you care. Before you think I'm not guilty of this, let me reassure you that I can certainly remember times that I also shrank from that choice. So this is something that just because I'm a therapist, I still have to remember and work on myself. So let's talk about what you can say when someone you know is battling depression. But before that, here's a special message from BetterHelp about what they have to offer and how you can save some money. When I was approached by BetterHelp now several months ago, COVID had emerged, and I'd maybe conducted a handful of telehealth sessions, mostly when someone was sick and couldn't make it into the office. Now, five months later, I'm even more of a believer in telehealth. It took some getting used to, But actually, clients sometimes seem more relaxed. It fits better into their schedule. And although many have told me they miss seeing me in person, it's still been a very fulfilling relationship. I've even started new patients, and they've told me they had positive experiences. So we've never actually met in person. 
BetterHelp is rated the number one online therapy service that's available to you wherever you live. Confidential and highly personalized It's much less expensive than normal talk therapy. You can text, have video chats, or just talk on the phone. You outline what you're looking for, and BetterHelp suggests several therapist options for you. If you don't seem to find a way to connect with one, they'll ask you more about what you're looking for and then suggest others. I, of course, tried it out before I was going to recommend it to you, and the two therapists I had sessions with listened well and made great suggestions for me, and one said, actually... I might make myself. I talked about my own panic disorder and a very scary situation I'd been through, and they were caring and thoughtful. And I was amazed at how easy it was to get in touch with them to make time changes, for example. Although BetterHelp can't be there in emergencies, nor could any online provider, they have all kinds of information about what you can do in that special circumstance. And today, BetterHelp has a great savings offer for you. If you use the link trybetterhelp.com slash selfwork, again, that's trybetterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash selfwork, you can enjoy a 10% discount on your first month of sessions. After five months of seeing how people relate to telehealth, I'd highly recommend it. If self-work has helped you, maybe BetterHelp can give you an even more personal experience with therapy. Emma Marie Smith is a mental health writer, and I found one of her articles that I thought offered some great and concrete advice on what to say to someone with depression and what not to say. And since you all know that I stress what you can do about it, this was the article for me. She had actually had her first diagnosed bout of depression after giving birth, or she had postpartum depression, and realized that she'd experienced those bouts all her life. So let me quote her for a second. First, she says, don't say, it'll be okay. It might not be okay, at least not for a while. A person deep in depression often can't see beyond what's right in front of them. Hearing it'll be okay often translates to the depressed person as, I want you or need you to be okay because right now you're a burden. This might not be what you mean, of course, but it's still an empty sentiment. It's kind of like saying, you'll feel better in the morning. It devalues what that person is feeling right now. She suggests to say instead, I'll help you get through this. We'll beat this together. This made me think of Andrew Solomon's famous description of depression. It's not a lack of happiness. It's a lack of vitality. Your energy, you stating that together the two of you are a team can be helpful. I sometimes say to my own patients when they are sort of lost and demoralized, you know what, you can borrow some of my optimism. It's a message from me that I've been here before with other people, and I've seen both the difficulty of healing, but the real possibility of healing. And they always smile at me when I say that. Emma Marie goes on, if all else fails, imagine how you would respond to a friend diagnosed with cancer, then do that. One of the nicest things anyone ever did for me in an acute depressive episode was buying me a Get Well Soon card. It recognized what I was feeling as a genuine illness. So this made me think about a guy named Gary who identified with perfectly hidden depression for many reasons, but he had just been hospitalized for suicidal ideation. He'd stay there about three months. He was discharged into my care. His family knew all about his hospitalization. He got home in August, and we began our work, which was slow going at first because of his struggle to feel anything real. But he made tremendous progress, with some relapses along the way, forward two steps, then back one kind of thing. But that's actually typical. His brother was the only one in his biological family that ever said anything to him. In fact, his father, when the whole family came over to my patient's home for Christmas dinner, his father was leaving but stopped, slapped him on the shoulder, and said, Glad that thing is better, or something as innocuous. Gary could see clearly at that moment how he'd gotten where he was and just how bad that felt. Okay, so now back to Emma Marie's points. She says, don't say, but you've got so much going for you. I warn people in my book about perfectly hidden depression, about opening up to people and hearing just this. Many people want to believe what's on the outside, what seems obvious, what things look like, instead of what they are. She made a suggestion I didn't particularly like, actually. So I'd say this instead of, you got so much going for you. I'd say, I love you, and if there's a part of you I don't see, 
then I'd like to listen and find out. Again, you're responding to someone saying, you know, sometimes I struggle with sadness or depression. And you'd say, but you've got so much going for you. That's not what they need to hear. You could say, I love you. And if there's a part of you that I don't understand or see, then I want to listen and find out. She goes back and her third is she says, don't say, let me know if I can help. And she writes, sigh. If someone tells you how they feel down, depressed, anxious, or suicidal, then that is asking for help. Please acknowledge how much inner strength it takes for them to open up about how they feel and then don't wait for them to ask you to do something. Say, I'm here and you make your own suggestions. Now, I'll add in my two bits. Of course, this takes commitment. If you say, I'm here, then your actions need to follow up. You text, you call, you go by, you check on them. You don't assume others do it. You think about some helpful things that perhaps would make their day easier. This doesn't mean you take responsibility for that person's struggle, like you can fix them. I heard the distinction the other day between being responsible and being responsive. That's what you want, to be responsive, to ask questions, not necessarily provide answers. This kind of commitment may, of course, be another reason people stay in denial or forget. They want to stay away from the commitment of really caring, of showing up. Okay, number four on Emma Marie's list is you don't say you just need to try meditation, yoga, drinking more water, exercising. You don't say that. It's not that these things aren't true. They do help depression, but they may be far out of reach for someone whose depression is currently winning that battle. Say instead, hey, You want to come to this yoga session or book club or exercise group with me? And then you explain that you're always in the back row and we can leave if it gets too hard or you get anxious. Set up a situation for them that you can invite them into. You know, when I was going through infertility treatment, several people thought they were helpful, telling me to just relax, to forget about it. Explanations were offered from it being God's will and it would happen to me being punished for something by that very same God and it wouldn't happen. Ugh, that was terrible. Thank goodness one day one woman said, Well, I hope it happens for you. I can see how you're doing everything in your power and it must be difficult. I could have kissed her. It just felt so empowering. And she wasn't telling me what to do. She was telling me she could see how hard I was trying. Here's number five and this is a huge no-no. You don't say, it's all in your head. This, in general, is the thing that's not only untrue, but very damaging. Depression isn't a choice. It has mental, emotional, and physical traits. We are only now beginning to understand what may be happening physiologically with depression, inflammation, gut issues. There's research into the opioid receptors. I definitely suggest episodes 142 and 143 that go into this research in depth. Because someone's body can feel heavy and achy, their appetite can be gone, or they can stay ravenous. They're not sleeping, they can have headaches, and generally feel as if they have weights tied to their body and their mind. If it's coupled with anxiety, it can feel as if you can't breathe or that your heart is racing all the time. What you do, instead of say, it's all in your head, you don't say anything. If that's the only thing you can think of to say, then don't say anything. I hope these concrete suggestions will help you to find the right thing to say. But again, I'll stress that more important than the right thing being said is that you're present with whoever you're trying to help. Non-judgmentally, responsive, listening, helping where you can, and supporting them along the way to get the help and treatment they need. Depression is hard to watch. You can feel helpless to help. But just being there can help. Your consistency your caring can matter so much. And again, if you say something that's not right, they still know you're there and they trust you and that will be okay. Our listener email today is very poignant and her last question of, what is wrong with me, struck my heart. I met my partner 25 years ago He had lots of issues stemming mainly from childhood abuse. By the time I met him, he considered himself damaged goods and couldn't understand why I would want to be with someone so unreliable, addicted to drinking and smoking. I told him I loved him and wanted to help him. He accepted. 
We spent the next 16 years in turmoil patiently dealing with his addiction, his depression, his physical ailments, his low self-esteem, etc. Personally, I asked for nothing in return, but was elated that he wanted to start a family of his own with me. We now have a wonderful son. Life was very tough finding our way through the dark. I tried so hard to hang on. I believed he could change for the better. And just as he seemed to be flourishing, he died. Suddenly, unexpectedly, age 40. Since his death, eight years have passed. And I changed for the worse. I live a nightmare. I'm a professional educated person, but I can't hold down a job anymore. My family and friends abandoned me, except my child, who had to wrongly be my rock. I'm a mess. I'm stuck in my previous life, and I can't seem to get out no matter what. I've had CBT help. I meditate. I do yoga. I go for walks. What's the matter with me? The first idea that came to me, so maybe the best, is that this listener's main concept of herself is as a helper. Some people might call that a schema or a conceptual identity that organizes your way of being. Some of us are helpers, some are leaders, some are challengers, some are teachers or healers. And when you can no longer be or you aren't anymore the way you were, you can feel very lost. She says quite easily and seemingly without anger that her relationship with her husband centered on him, helping him with his addictions, trying to help him heal the idea that he was damaged goods, And it sounds like they were successful. And then the time to enjoy the efforts of all that work seemed to vanish with his death. She blames herself for asking her son to be her rock, again seeming to me to be shame that she's become someone who needs help rather than the helper. Now, we can say that this was not a great relationship with her own needs taking a back seat, that maybe she was codependent and not focused on her own life. Maybe she is angry. That could be true. But it's the kind of anger that's part of grief, I would think. And she's stuck in that grief. Something is gone that she feels like she can't get back. But there's another facet of this that's interesting to understand. There's a phenomenon called complicated grief. It's a prolonging for years of the grief process. Here are the symptoms. Intense sorrow, pain, and rumination over the loss of your loved one. Focus on little else but your loved one's death. An extreme focus on reminders of the loved one or excessive avoidance of reminders. Intense and persistent longing or pining for the deceased. Problems accepting the death. Numbness or detachment. Bitterness about your loss. Feeling that life holds no meaning or purpose. A lack of trust in others. And an inability to enjoy life or think back on positive experiences with your loved one. It also may be indicated if you continue to have trouble carrying out normal routines, isolate from others and withdraw from social activities, experience depression, deep sadness, guilt, or self-blame, believe that you did something wrong or could have prevented the death, feel life isn't worth living without your loved one, or wish you'd even died along with your loved one. Certainly this sounds like our listener, doesn't it? She tells us that she's done cognitive behavioral therapy, but my idea is that perhaps she needs a more emotive kind of therapy where she forms a deeper relationship with a therapist and begins to reinterpret what those years meant. I do this kind of work all the time with people who have gotten divorced, but it can also be true after a death of a spouse. You got through the hard years, and then they're gone. So what is the meaning of all those efforts when you're now alone? I liken it to if you had put money in a bank, Over time, every week, every month, you sacrificed and put something in the bank, and then you go to get it out, and all the money's gone. So you'd have to ask yourself, what did I learn from that experience? How could I reinterpret my choices and my behavior, given the fact that I have no money, or in this instance, that my partner died? Your reasoning or your interpretation can include your children, but it's also got to be about you. What did those efforts and that love mean in the context of this woman going on living, which she is obviously not doing? And here's one more aspect. There could also be something called survivor guilt. How do I get to keep living when they did not? So you can't allow yourself to enjoy the present because somehow that's a betrayal or an abandonment of the person that died. You must stay in mourning out of loyalty. This may sound irrational, but I've seen it in people over the years. 
what has to be worked through is the randomness of her loss. There is no reason you're still alive. You simply are. And it sounds as if this listener needs to find a way to regain the feeling of being a helper, regain the vitality she found in life. Maybe this time it's with someone who doesn't struggle quite as much as her former husband did, or maybe she'll find someone else that needs her help. Of course, we can also hope that her first husband learned to do that as well, that he did give back to her after he struggled with his own esteem and addictions. She says it was really going great. So perhaps there was a give and take there, and she has to mourn that, that she didn't get much of that in return. So many facets here. I hope this is helpful. Thank you so much for reaching out. Thank you very much for being here at Self Work today. Our team is taking a little break, but what I'm going to do is pick not necessarily some of the most popular podcasts that I've done in four years, but I'm going to choose three or four of them that are very tangible, concrete kinds of offerings. People really seem to like that. After all, I talk about what you could do about it, and they'll have new intros and that kind of thing. But I'm having some eye surgery, and so we need to take a little break to give both my brain and my eyes a rest, as well as my audio engineers. But I have a special guest coming on. I was thrilled when he said he would come on and do a podcast interview with me. It's Lewis Howes. His podcast, The School of Greatness, actually gets 10 million downloads a month. 10 million. And he has written a book about being sexually abused when he was a child. And so we'll talk about that mostly. I'm thrilled to have him on in November. And we'll most likely open the season with that conversation for you to learn from. I know that I will learn from it. But please feel free to continue to reach out to me at AskDrMargaret at DrMargaretRutherford.com. My website is DrMargaretRutherford.com, and you can subscribe there, and you will get a weekly newsletter with the blog post and the podcast. So many of you have left ratings and reviews both on Amazon for the book Perfectly Hidden Depression, which if you've thought about buying it, I would hope that you do. It's underneath $15 for the paperback and under $10 for the Kindle version. So it's not a huge outlay of money. But I know these are tough times for many people, but I'm a little concerned about what's happening to perfectionists in this pandemic. It's also a workbook. It has over 60 exercises, so it's not just a understand it or analyze it. It's a book about what you can do about it. You can also join my Facebook closed group at facebook.com slash groups slash self work. So I have no idea if there are any of you that have been around for the entire four years. If you have, I should celebrate you. <laughs> That's for sure. But thank you to all of you for the last four years. We'll take a little break and then we'll be back with new material about the second week of November. Take very good care. I'm Dr. Margaret. And this has been Self Work.